In this lesson, we will cover the diagnostic challenge, the diagnostic process, missed, miss, and incidental diagnosis in pediatric issues. Not surprisingly, the challenges that exist in defining what Chiari is carries over to the topic of diagnosis. Recall that Chiari is defined radiographically, meaning based on imaging, with the criteria being the tip of the cerebellar tonsils being located 5 millimeters or more below the opening in the bottom of the skull. However, over the years, it has become apparent that many people meet this definition, but do not and likely will not ever have any Chiari-related symptoms. This by itself is enough to say that imaging alone is not enough to diagnose someone with symptomatic Chiari, but unfortunately there is more. A second problem with defining Chiari based on a measurement is that it assumes that measurement can be made with a certain level of accuracy and precision. While MRIs are amazing machines, not every MRI is equal in terms of the quality of images it can produce. This, combined with issues of patients moving during scans, can make it difficult to accurately make measurements at the millimeter level. Beyond this, actually measuring tonsillar position is part science and part art. This means that different people, even experts, can come up with different tonsillar position values from the same images. Studies have shown that experts can disagree on this critical value by 5 millimeters or more, which is the very definition of Chiari. The end result of this is that imaging alone, while very important to diagnosing Chiari, is not enough by itself. In fact, while it may be surprising to new patients, there is no single objective test to diagnose Chiari. Rather than a single test, the Chiari diagnostic process involves several factors which a doctor, often a neurosurgeon, will take into account in making an informed, intelligent decision. These factors include a patient's symptoms and whether they are consistent with and likely to be caused by Chiari, the result of a neurological exam, the result of imaging and other tests, and the physician's personal experience and judgment when it comes to Chiari. As we discussed in the lesson on symptoms, the hallmark symptom for Chiari is an intense, crushing headache in the back of the head brought on by straining or coughing. When a patient says they are experiencing this type of headache, it is a significant clue to a physician that Chiari could be the cause. However, if a patient has headaches that are more like migraines, then it becomes more complicated. While migraines are common among Chiari patients, they are also common in general and poorly understood. In fact, many of the most common Chiari symptoms, such as neck pain, balance issues, and brain fog, can be due to many different things, and so by themselves are not specific to a Chiari diagnosis, but rather one piece of the puzzle. While there is no single definitive test for symptomatic Chiari, MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is the goal standard. An MRI can create a detailed picture of the brain, skull, spine, and spinal cord, which the physician can use to see if the cerebellar tonsils are herniated, whether there is space for cerebrospinal fluid to flow, whether there are bony abnormalities, and whether there is a syrinx, or a collection of fluid in the spinal cord itself. We will discuss syrinxes more in the lesson on related conditions, but for now, it is important to know that the presence of a syrinx is close to an automatic diagnostic indicator. Depending on what type of doctor is doing the investigating, and whether the case is complicated or straightforward, sometimes Chiari patients will undergo further tests. These can include additional MRIs of the entire spine, CT scans, a special type of MRI to look at the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, balance testing, urodynamic testing, cognitive testing, or sleep studies. A very important part of the diagnostic process is the neurological exam. The neurological exam has been used for hundreds of years and is the most basic tool in a neurologist or neurosurgeon's diagnostic toolkit. While low-tech, this type of exam can reveal a tremendous amount of useful information. A neurological exam provides a physician with a way to explore the function of the nervous system by seeing how different parts of the body respond to different stimulus and tasks. This is because the nerves of the human body have been carefully mapped out, so we know where nerves that carry sensation from and muscle commands to different parts of the body enter the spinal cord. We also know what parts of the brain control different things like balance and autonomic reflexes. A complete neurological exam is an extensive procedure that involves testing the strength of different muscles, the response to different kinds of touch, tests of coordination and gait, testing balance, autonomic reflexes, and more. The neurological exam shows if different parts of the nervous system, such as the brainstem and cranial nerves, are functioning properly and can provide strong, objective clues as to whether a herniation found on MRI is causing problems. However, it's important to keep in mind that many doctors will only check enough things until they are satisfied they know what is going on. 
Sometimes this can be disconcerting to a patient who may feel the doctor is not being thorough, but from the doctor's point of view, they have enough information and they don't need to perform every test. The final piece of the puzzle is the individual physician's own experience and judgment. This can be difficult for patients to accept, but the reality is that doctors must pull together all the information and make an informed decision based on their experience as to what is causing a person's symptoms. In some cases, this decision is straightforward, while in other cases, it is not so clear. The practical implication for a patient is that if they have symptoms that could be from Chiari, but could also be due to something else, and if the MRI is not conclusive, they are likely to get different opinions from different doctors. With this in mind, Conquer Chiari advises patients who ask about getting second opinions to be prepared to hear different opinions. Some people want to hear all the opinions and options, but for others, it can be frustrating when they don't get a definitive answer. Because of the ambiguities that come with Chiari, patients end up taking many different paths to a final diagnosis. For some people, diagnosis can come quickly after a sudden onset of symptoms, but for others, it can take years and many different doctors to finally get a diagnosis. For example, a survey of over 1,300 adult female Chiari patients showed that one-third identified a specific event, often some type of trauma, that triggered their symptoms and started their search for a diagnosis. But of course, this means that for the rest, there wasn't a specific event. Similarly, people may start their diagnostic journey with different types of doctors. Some people may start with a sleep doctor due to apnea, while others may see a neurologist for migraines and still others may see an ear, nose, throat doctor due to balance problems. But in the end, since the primary treatment for symptomatic Chiari is surgical, Conquer Chiari recommends that anyone with an MRI indication of cerebellar herniation and symptoms be evaluated by a neurosurgeon. While some people are diagnosed quickly, far too often a Chiari patient's symptoms are dismissed and the diagnosis is missed. This young woman's symptoms became so bad that she was essentially in crisis. Doctor after doctor brushed off what was happening to her and blamed it on stress or other factors. Only when her symptoms were crippling did she get an accurate diagnosis. Unfortunately, this is a major problem for the Chiari community, especially for adult patients. The lack of an objective test, probably combined with the fact that most adult patients are women, results in many Chiari patients being told their symptoms are psychological in nature. In fact, a study of over 300 Chiari patients found that over half had been told by a doctor they suffered from a mental problem. In addition to missed diagnosis, Chiari is also sometimes misdiagnosed as something else. Because of overlapping symptoms, Chiari patients have been wrongly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, cluster headaches, ALS, and even carpal tunnel syndrome. At the other end of the spectrum are incidental diagnoses, this is when imaging is ordered for some other reason, such as after a head injury and a herniation is found, but the person does not have a history of Chiari-type symptoms and was not looking for a diagnosis of any kind. This type of incidental finding is more common among kids who may be routinely imaged after a sports-related head injury. Recall that up to 3% of children actually have cerebellar herniation of 5 millimeters or more. So if someone gets an MRI due to concussion-related issues, then if they are one of those 3%, it will likely be noted by the radiologist. This can be worrisome for patients who aren't sure what to make of it. We will discuss this more in depth later in the course. But fortunately, among children, very few incidentally found cases end up becoming symptomatic in the near to medium future. That is not the only difference between pediatric and adult Chiari in terms of diagnosis. Although there is no definitive evidence for this, in general, it seems like Chiari is more readily diagnosed among children. In fact, a survey of pediatric neurosurgeons found that most thought that pediatricians in general had the proper training and education to diagnose and refer Chiari. You have to wonder what a similar survey among adult neurosurgeons would say about primary care providers. However, not all the differences are positive. For young children, especially pre-verbal, diagnosis can be difficult. If a child cannot express what they are feeling, their symptoms may result in changes in behavior, attitude, and affect, which may be dismissed as developmental phases or diagnosed as something else. Also, an MRI on a younger child is more complicated and likely to require sedation. This may make a physician more reluctant to order the test. To summarize, there is no single objective test to diagnose Chiari. Diagnosis is a process that involves symptoms, imaging, a neurological exam, and a physician's experience and judgment. Up to one third of patients can identify a specific event, often some type of trauma, that sparked their symptoms. 
Chiari diagnoses are often missed, especially among adults, or misdiagnosed as something else. Sometimes a herniation is found incidental, meaning when there are no symptoms. Diagnosing Chiari in young children can be difficult if they can't verbalize what they are feeling. 